Welcome back to Refresh Your Marriage. We're going to dive into a subject that's really intimate, sex and romance. That's right. They're both important. They're equally important. And we want you to refresh your marriage sexually and romantically. A husband complained one time that his wife wore so many layers of clothing to bed, he didn't even know how to begin with his sexual adventure with her. Between the sweatshirts and the sweatpants and the three layers of socks, and sometimes she would even wear gloves. It's like the guy doesn't even have a chance. And I want you to know that we're all wired differently. Our body temperatures are different. Our perceptions are different. Some people like the lights on during intimacy. Some like the lights off. Some like intimacy in the morning and some in the evening and everything in between. We want to talk about this because it's really important. And I believe that what goes on in our bedroom and, and our romantic relationship has a tremendous impact on every other aspect of our marriages. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3, at the top of your handout, and it's talking here about sex and sexuality. And it says, husbands should fulfill their marital duty to their wives sexually. And likewise, the wives to their husbands. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband sexually. And in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but he yields it to his wife. And then it says, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and only for a short time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, then come back together again sexually, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And there it is. This scripture tells us that we should not withhold sexuality from our partners because frequent and often sexuality within marriage protects it from Satan and his tricks and his temptations and all that goes along with that, especially in today's culture. There are so many ways now that Satan can creep into our relationships and our intimacy sort of goes out the window and our closeness and our sexuality. And if we're not careful, we start looking for it elsewhere. And that's why this passage is here and that's why it's so important. I want to talk about sex and I want to talk about romance. So let's, let's unveil this, let's unpack this. I mean, ladies might be more interested at times in talking about what goes on before sex. I hear this quite often where wives might talk about the specific details of what they'd like to see happen in the relationship that makes them want to be sexual. Men, they kind of reverse that. I see men sometimes just saying, listen, if we're sexual, that really inspires me to be relational. While the wife is saying, well, if we were more relational, I'd want to be more sexual. To some degree, not all couples are wired this way, but to some degree, there's an imbalance. There's this opposition. Let's just start with what women want. And I know there's exceptions to every rule, but in general, we're finding that women care more about what goes on before the sexual activity. So using football as an analogy, I would say that they care more about the pre-game preparation than the game. Or what goes on before the touchdown matters as much as the touchdown. What is the pregame show? So guys, if you're taking notes, write this down. The pregame show. What is it? The pregame preparation. And as you round the bases during this segment, guys, I want you to get this out of her. Get this out of your wife. What specifically is it about 
the pre-game show that she likes the most? What does she want from you a day in advance or the day of or an hour in advance? Some women want their husbands to do housework before they have sex because it turns them on. It's like vacuum the house for me, will you? Do some laundry, shake the rugs, sweep the floors, do the dishes. And guys, you might be like, what does that have to do with sex? Well, for some women, it has everything to do with sex because they feel close to you. They feel like you're contributing to all the needs of the home and they love that. So it's important for you to round the bases in this segment, guys, and get out of your wife. What is it that she needs from you the day before sex, the day of sex, leading up to sex? What does the pregame show look like? Now let's move in to the actual sexual activity. This kind of leans more towards what guys want. And I would just say, ladies, when you round the bases, I want you to get out of your husband what he wants, how often he wants it. It's one of the big complaints men might have is the frequency that their wives initiate sex. And so ladies, I would talk to him about that. What does it mean to initiate, how often? Would he like you to initiate and be very specific and be very graphic, guys, when you're speaking with your spouse on what you like, what you want, and how often? And by the time you're done rounding the bases in this segment, you should both clearly understand what the other person needs and what the other person wants. And before we go any further, I want to lay out some guardrails regarding sex. There are a couple general rules that we would encourage you to follow. Don't ever pressure your spouse to do something they're extremely uncomfortable trying. Get their buy-in beforehand. Secondly, don't include anything in your marriage relationship that would be pornographic or that would include any images, videos of other people ever. God wants our marriage to be pure and holy in His sight, and He wants our sexuality to be completely contained just between the two of us. But within those guidelines, have fun, experiment, talk about it first, agree to some things first, and, and, and stretch yourselves a little bit and, and think outside of the box a little bit and, and talk through it, communicate through it. One last thing to remember regarding sex. If for some reason you or your spouse is unable to engage in sexual intimacy and to be specific sexual intercourse, I want you both to discuss alternative things that you can do that would be sexual, that would still stimulate each other and enjoy that part of your relationship. I would also encourage you to go get some special counseling, either from a doctor or someone to help you if you're really struggling in this area. And lastly, there are so many things that you can do that are intimate, that are non-sexual. So keep all that in mind. I think intimacy, whether it's sexual or non-sexual, can be very powerful. I know couples who spend almost every evening with back rubs, foot rubs, sitting side by side on their couch, maybe holding hands as you go for walks. I used to watch my father put lotion on my mother's legs almost every night. It was also not uncommon for me to watch my mother lie her head down on my father's lap and he would brush her hair. Neither of these things are sexual, but they are very intimate. So as you round the bases, be mindful of this, be very sensitive to each other. Build this part of your marriage so that you can feel refreshed and renewed. I'd like you to do something a little different as well during this segment. At the bottom of your session log on the first page, it says document your commitments. And by now you know what that means. You're going to round the bases on the issues that populated in your assessment. You're going to solve and resolve them. 
But in addition to that, in that segment at the bottom of your page, I'd like for you to write down specifically one thing you would like from your spouse that's sexual or romantic. So I think for the men, I would lean towards write down one thing or two that you would clearly want her to know that you need sexually. And for her, I would have the wife write down one or two things that you need from him romantically. Be specific. Be very, very articulate. And in this way, you're going to discover more from each other. And, and then share that with each other so that you can take it to the bank. You can take it in the next week or two and allow it to change you. Allow it to change your relationship for the better. That's what refreshing your marriage is all about. Learning from your spouse and then applying it. When you're done with that, go to the next page, answer the remaining questions. And now I want to hand you over to Dr. Emerson Egrich as he unveils his wisdom and his thoughts regarding sex and romance. I'll see you soon. Welcome back. Well, we're going to dive into a subject now. So you've gotten through a lot of segments. We're proud of you. You're doing well. You're rounding the bases. You're learning a lot about love and respect, what it means, how to do it. But we're now going to embark upon a subject that might be exciting to you. I mean, you might, you might have been like, man, I can't wait to get to this segment. Sex and romance. And the word sex might really excite one of you or both of you. And the word romance might excite only one of you or both of you or neither of you. We would need to unpack all this. I often feel that sex can often be a barometer that is sort of reflecting the health of the overall relationship. So Emerson, what do you think of that? Do you, do you have a thought regarding that sentiment about sex being a barometer? And what say you? Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, it works both ways. Uh, it, you know, obviously, if the relationship is not healthy, it certainly is going to adversely affect, you know, the sexual relationship. But there's people out there, conservative sex experts, who sometimes talk about just move forward sexually, um, respond to each other sexually, and it'll enhance and help the relationship. And so there are both sides of that equation. I think I'd agree with both sides because recently I talked to a counselor and he, he said, I just tell couples, um, have as much sex as you can. And you might find that the other issues become a little more minimized, not to minimize your pain, but he makes a good point. Also, I believe in scripture that sort of indicates that frequent intimacy can act as a shield against Satan, his temptations and all of the like. But here's what I want to do. In what ways does love and respect enhance our sexual intimacy and our romantic intimacy? Or maybe in what ways does a lack of love and respect affect the bedroom? What are your thoughts? Well, I think there's a gender issue here that sometimes we don't pay attention to. Obviously, we all know or we should know that a woman is going to respond sexually if she feels loved. Uh, one of the points I make is that the, the key to arousing a woman sexually is by not trying to arouse her sexually. I mean, the point is you need to love her for who she is, independent of the sexual relationship. Affection without sexual intent, conversations without sexual intent. That's the irony, and that is uh, a reality. And some say that, uh, you know, romance is the drama for a woman. Uh, sex is the intermission. And, and God is just hardwired her differently, but that doesn't mean that she's disinterested in sex. She very much wants to be sexually intimate on a frequent basis, but the things that stimulate that are not necessarily sexual kinds of things. I mean, for instance, if she goes to a wedding with you, uh, she will perhaps be sexually aroused that evening because when you talk about love, you talk about relationships, you talk about care, you talk about how two people met, these are the things that stimulate a woman. She is what we call an integrated personality. Her mind, body, soul, and spirit are all connected. So in her spirit, her emotions are affected by love. Physiologically, then, 
she's in a far better position to respond sexually. And every man needs to understand that. Uh, and once he does, it uh, changes the nature of the relationship. But there's another side of this equation that we don't often pay attention to. And given the anatomy of the male is, is a visual aid that God has given to us, he needs sexual release in, in a way that she doesn't. She needs emotional release more often. She does need sex release, but three days a month, or especially when she's wanting to have a baby, sexual intensity is there for her. But by and large, it's more about the emotional love connection, and the sexual is an expression of that. Men have a biological need for sexual release in and of itself. And what we haven't, I think, paid enough attention to, it's not just about him being selfish. One of the points I make is he has a need for sexual release, and, and how's that need to be met? His wife is the only one that can help him meet that need unless he uses ways that would not be appropriate. So he has a need that only she can meet. But what happens is that sometimes he's labeled as selfish rather than feeling that he's vulnerable and then missing this love and respect connection in that you really honor the husband's spirit. You're really respecting him when you understand his vulnerability and his need for sexual intimacy and his need for sexual release. But of course, this becomes a, a tremendous place for conflict between two people. And there are also seasons. Early on, ten, it tends to be that men want to be sexually intimate more than the wife. But when they're in their 70s, you know, he's less interested and she wants that affection and sexual intimacy more. There, is, there are these seasons. So this is why 1 Corinthians 7 says each is to fulfill their duty to the other. And in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is making the point that basically both have a need for sex. But what he also makes the point is, he says very clearly, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. He's talking there about each has equal say when it comes to sexual intimacy. And I always like to raise this question, well, who decides on Tuesday night if they have equal authority? This passage is dealing with egalitarianism. There are other places where the husband is the head, and I think he's... 51% responsible to die for his wife. She's not responsible to die for him. He has a greater responsibility, greater authority. Uh, he's the head. But when it comes to sexual intimacy in 1 Corinthians 7, it's egalitarian. It's totally equal. So it raises the question, who decides on Tuesday night if they're going to have sex or they're not going to have sex? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and Paul goes on to 1 Corinthians 7, 28. He says, if you marry, if not sin, but you will have trouble. You will have trouble. The sexual realm is an area that God has designed with his divine purposes to create some tension. You're gonna have trouble on Tuesday night as to who decides. And Matt, many people have not come to uh, this realization and they think that they have a bad relationship because on Tuesday night, they're at odds with each other. They have these clashing preferences. And I make the point in our Love and Respect Conference as well as in our Love and Respect book that this tension is God-given and two mature people need to accept this and realize that there's gonna be an ebb and flow here. But the key is this, if your wife is feeling unloved, she's not gonna to respond to you sexually, not, not with her whole heart, and you're gonna recognize that. And so the challenge for you is you need to ask yourself, does she feel loved by me? You can't be harsh and angry with her and then expect sexual intimacy. Does my wife feel loved? If she does, she'll respond to your humble appeal. At the same time, wives, because you don't have a need for sex. And women have said this to my wife, Sarah, I don't have the time, I don't have the interest, I don't have the energy, so there. So it all becomes based on your need as a woman. And if you don't have that need, then neither one of you should. And when you do that, you're sending a message of dishonor, disrespect to the spirit of your husband in the same way your sweet daughter-in-law says, I don't have interest in having sex with him. Your son, at a certain point, is gonna feel dishonored. And as I pointed out um, in the conference, and you highlighted it here, Paul said very clearly, stop depriving one another, except by agreement, come together again, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This isn't just an issue of sex. This is a spiritual attack that can happen to one or both of you because you're not paying attention spiritually to how the enemy would use this. So here's the bottom line. The enemy's gonna show up, gentlemen, if you are unloving, harsh, and angry, uh, you're just you're going to undermine the sexual relationship, and this is replete with difficulties. And ladies, if you just say, "Well, I don't have a need here," rather than worshiping Jesus Christ, 
worshiping Christ in the act of sex, giving yourself to your husband because he has a need that only you can meet. And you honor his deepest heart when you do that because he has a vulnerability where you don't. If both of you move forward on the love and respect approach to this, even though it, it may feel sacrificial, there are going to be times she's tired, she's exhausted, she's got the flu and three kids under five, and she's going to say no. But if you huff and puff and, you know, or you try to say, well, you know, it hurts me a little bit, but I understand, I understand. If over the period of time you're empathetic, but you keep meeting each other halfway, you will do fine. You will do fine because Tuesday night's coming and someone has to make that decision. And the best way is to do the ebb and flow, give and take, and you'll do fine. Hey, Emerson, it's Tuesday night. Is that reflective of anything or are you just grabbing that night? <laughs> well, that's a good that's a good point. It's kind of like the guy that the, 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 the men's conference, they had a thousand men there. And how many of you men have sex at least twice a week? And lots of, how many have had it once a month? And how many have it twice, you know, in, 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 in you know, a year kind of thing? How many have it once a year? One guy in the back was shouting, it's me, it's me once a year. And he's jumping up and down. He's all excited. And the guy says, why are you so excited? Because tonight's the night. <laughs> oh, man. Well, listen. That brings up another question, um, because I think there are so many angles we could take, and there's, we could turn this into a, an eight-hour conference, really, which we're not going to do, but men tend to want intimacy more. However, there's, there are flip sides to every conversation we're going to have. I know some men who uh, they don't want as much intimacy sexually as their wife does. One guy in particular said, man, she wants intimacy almost every night, and I just want her to leave me alone for a week or two. Just give me a break. And I, well, that's probably not the norm. So when couples round the bases, our objective here is to increase two separate items. One is sexual intimacy, and the other is relational intimacy. As you stated, what motivates women in general um, the relationship side and the romantic side. And so I think when couples round the bases, I really want them to be specific. So let me ask you this, Emerson, is it difficult for men to articulate and even talk about their needs with their wife and why? Uh, talking about their need for sexual intimacy? Yes. Yes. I mean, I think people are very self-conscious. This is a very, very intimate conversation. And, uh, and what happens is we end up sending messages of, of uh, anger, you know, uh, we have attitudes, you know, we pout. Uh, we're trying to send a message, as we talked about earlier, this is that language, it's not communication, it's mutual understanding. So typically it's totally misunderstood by her and vice versa. And so, but you are leading there a little bit with romance. And I think the highlight here is, Gentlemen need to understand her desire to do things with you in a friendship way. That, that's why women love to go out, uh, have dinner together where they can talk. They see that as a, a setting where they can connect with you and talk heart to heart. They have things on their heart that they like talking about. And when they're permitted to do that, they just feel energized. And they are therefore going to be responsive uh, in a sexual realm. Uh, if you, on the other hand, just say, look, uh, I need sex, I don't have a need for all this talk, you're very imprudent. It would be extremely foolish for you to draw that kind of conclusion. God calls you as a man to meet a need your wife has that you might not have, as we talked about. And when two goodwill people are willing again to meet each other halfway, it just works. There is no question about that. But I don't know if I'm scratching where you're itching there. Did I answer your question? You did. You reminded me one night, um, I took Pam to um, Lowe's. And then we went to Sam's and we went to another store. I don't like shopping at all. I don't know why. I mean, I can fish all day long. I can hunt. I can golf. I can do something active and I'm not tired. But the moment I walk into a department store, for some reason, it's exhausting for me. And so we're walking and, and she reaches over and she takes me by the hand and she says this. And it took me by surprise. She says, I absolutely love it when you're with me when I'm shopping. And I was perplexed. I'm like, I don't know why. And I even asked her, why? Because I don't contribute one thing while we're shopping. And she said, I just like that you're here. 
And that evening, she initiated intimacy. Wow. I just connected those two dots that you kind of threw out there. The friendship, when you foster the friendship, that sparks something in her. And I don't know that we get that really well as men. Well, I think in some ways we do, but it's applied in a different area. And I would turn the tables here a little bit and appeal to the woman with an illustration that we get is that men uh, enjoy friendship shoulder to shoulder without talking. And in some ways, I think the point you make about Pam is a great one because I think a lot of women would love for their husbands to go with them and just be with them as they do these different activities. It does energize many women. Some women, I suppose not, but, but it's a very powerful illustration of your presence being with her, uh, walking hand in hand in that setting. That can be very, very meaningful to her. And one of the points we make in our conference, and Sarah makes this very excellent, uh, in an excellent way, that we encourage women to go hunting with their husbands, let's say, if he's a hunter, and just be with him shoulder to shoulder without talking. And we make the point that that seems just absurd to most women. If you're not talking, how are you going to have a quality relationship? Because in women's mind, you have to talk in order to have a very close relationship. But one of the points we make is that you can energize your husband by simply being with him shoulder to shoulder without talking. And Pam's illustration there hints at the fact that women, I think, would get it. It's in a different setting. But if you apply it over here. So this idea of romance and energizing your spouse Men also need friendship. They want friendship. They're not as sentimental so that, oh, I can't believe you, you know, the candle. Some men are, but by and large, it's a little bit different, but it's as deep. Just that friendship and what happens over time when three kids come along, you don't go with them anymore. You don't, you don't do what you used to. You used to be in the stands watching him when he was playing intramural ball or something. And, and he just was so proud to have you there and so exciting to him. But we, we stop that. And so what happens is the friendship ceases. So if we put sex, romance, slash friendship, meaning the male friendship, female romance, and begin to understand what is it that brings about a sense of connection? What brings about a sense of, of a closeness? Men want to be close. They want their wife to be their best friend. But it isn't always the result of a romantic evening. It's watching him play intramural ball. And once we begin to reach out that way, even though it's not meaningful to me, if I realize it's meaningful to my spouse, wow. And I say this, ladies, you could spend three hours talking heart to heart with your husband and be fully energized, whereas he's not as energized. You want him to be, but he's not. But you go watch a basketball game for an hour with him. He will be energized. He will feel as energized by that. But many women think that doesn't make sense. How can he be energized if we didn't talk? That's because you're a female. Just trust me here. Look at your sons. Do your sons call you out to watch you? Have you watched them play catch together? The boys don't want to talk to you as the mother. They want you to watch them. Let's just trust that God's wired us differently. And what causes us as males to be energized is different. It's an equal need, but it's a different need. As we work with each other on this, we'll begin to grin. We'll begin to get excited. And you can do this. You can do it. It's not that hard. You're meeting a need that the other person has, even though I don't have it. And usually it results in sex. And let me say, the women who want more sex, if you're showing contempt toward the spirit of your husband on an ongoing basis, he's not going to want to be sexually intimate with you. No husband wants sex with a woman that has contempt toward him. He's just going to shut down on that any more than a woman wants sex with a man who's harsh and angry and unloving. Once we get in tune, though, with this love and respect dynamic, Healing comes quite quickly, so apply it. Don't be afraid. You have power. Hey, I like that. And I also want to remind the viewers that when you round the bases and you face some of these issues and you learn how to score and you learn how to resolve your issues in a way that doesn't hurt the other person, and for some of you, it's the first time you're ever going to experience this, and the outcome is going to be wonderful, and it's going to start to stimulate feelings inside your heart and it's going to it's going to foster the friendship that Emerson's talking about here and the outcome of that is often either it's either romantic or it stimulates sexuality but as you know in watching this segment on sex and romance you still have work to do at defining uh, some details as you round the bases and you also need to define some details about 
what the romantic friendship looks like. And so that's your role for this segment is to look at your assessment, figure out some of those points that need to be addressed, round the bases and score. And so there you go. You're released. We look forward to seeing you in the next segment.